So this episode is about hydralazine, also known as hope, confusion, and WTF. Or hydralazine for cancer, what's real, what's new, and what the internet misrepresents. A 70-year-old blood pressure drug is being hailed as a breakthrough for glioblastoma. Is hydralazine actually a game changer? Maybe. Or is the internet overselling the science? Definitely. Hello, and welcome to Elevating Cancer Treatment, where we explain the science and debunk myths to help you navigate your health journey. My background is a little different. Beyond educating about cancer, I'm actually designing new drugs that are defining the future of oncology. This direct, hands-on experience offers me a very different perspective of how these cancer treatments work on the body, interact with the cancer cells, and cause side effects. And these are insights that I'm excited to share with you. If that sounds interesting, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you never miss an update. And please share it if you find it useful. I'm Dr. Jay Chaplin. An important reminder, I'm a PhD, not an MD. The information in this video is education, and it's not medical advice. Every cancer is unique, and no general information applies to everyone. Please remember that. Always consult with your healthcare provider for guidance on your specific situation. And two quick things. First, as a thank you for being here, I've created a free resource, 10 Things to Elevate Your Chemo Journey, which you can download from the link below. And second, by signing up, you'll also get updates on that innovative cancer treatment I'm working on. I'm confident it represents a significant advancement in immunotherapy. So please take a moment, download your free guide, and join us in shaping the future of cancer Don't treatment. Mind. Is hydralazine actually a game changer? Let's unpack what the data actually shows. A paper published this October, 2025, has people calling it a breakthrough and absolutely groundbreaking for GBM. So today, we're going to do three things. We're going to review what we already knew about hydralazine from the lab and clinically, because it's an old drug. Two, we're going to talk about what's genuinely new and genuinely exciting in this latest paper. There's great stuff in there. And number three, we're going to talk about what this paper doesn't say and why that matters a lot both for hydralazine's promise and for roadblocks, particularly in GBM. So stick around because there are some great aspects to this work and some things that are frankly being massively misrepresented online. Part one, what is hydralazine really? Hydralazine is a very old drug. It comes from an era when medicine wasn't about drug design, it was about drug discovery. You had no idea how stuff worked. You just tried things and sometimes you got lucky. So hydralazine was developed by C. Begeige, and researchers there were actually trying to treat malaria. Didn't work for malaria. Didn't do a darn thing. Instead, they stumbled onto something really unexpected. The drug lowered blood pressure. It worked really well. It was safe, and it was approved all the way back in 1953, even though nobody had the slightest idea how it worked. That was like aspirin for decades, actually for a really long time. So, that lack of understanding about the mechanism, how it actually worked, is important for the later story. So, part two, blood flow, tumors, and a 1989 insight. What we later learned, pretty quickly, is that hydralazine relaxes blood vessels. Again, we still didn't know how, we didn't know why, but we knew that it regulated blood pressure by relaxing blood vessels. And that matters for cancer because many tumors have terrible blood flow, which makes it really hard to deliver chemotherapy drugs effectively. So, Back in 1989, when the drug was already generic, dirt cheap, a paper showed something really important. When hydralazine was given alongside standard chemotherapy, it increased blood flow to tumors. And more blood flow means more chemo drug was actually reaching the cancer. Better delivery means better responses. That's exactly what they saw. This is similar to one of the major benefits of Avastin, the anti-angiogenesis treatment, where Avastin normalizes blood supply to tumors and allows more of the chemo drugs in. Okay. We've known that hydralazine does this effectively for over 35 years, and yet we don't really talk about it much. Part three, epigenetics, turning genes back on. So later, researchers started diving deeper into how hydralazine works, and they wanted to look at what it did inside of cells. And this led to a major discovery. Hydralazine affects epigenetics, specifically DNA methylation. So a quick primer, just because a gene exists in your DNA doesn't mean that it's active. It doesn't mean that it's on. Cancer cells often shut down important genes by methylating them. They put a little mark on the promoter and then the gene isn't read off. Some of the things that they do this to are tumor suppressor genes that would make the cancer cell kill itself. 
or immune recognition markers like MHC1 that we talked about that's required for killer T cells to get rid of cancer. They want to shut that off. Or signals that activate natural killer cells like MYC-A. We'll talk about that later. Those last two are especially important for supporting immunotherapies for cancer and something that we help our clients weigh adding to their treatment, especially if they're on an immunotherapy. It can be really beneficial. So hydralazine can reverse some of that methylation and turn those genes back on, maybe resensitizing cancers. And when researchers tested this in cancer cell lines, the results were really impressive. Overall, cancer cells dramatically re-expressed tumor suppressors. They became visible to the immune system again. They slowed their growth down or even committed suicide, what we would call apoptosis. But there's a couple of catches. There almost always are. Part four, limits of the evidence. Almost all of that work on epigenetics was done in cancer cell lines in culture or cancer cell lines implanted into mice in only a couple of cases. Almost all in culture, in a dish just a couple of times into mice. Now, a few experiments were done with cancer cells directly from patients, what we call primary cancer cells. But again, this was in culture. Now, cell line studies, even when they're in animals implanted, that's the lowest bar of biomedical evidence. Why? Because they almost always look good, and very few of those studies translate to people. Now, also, almost all of those studies were done with a combination, not just hydralazine, but another epigenetic drug called valproate. So what do we know about human beings? Part five, what the clinical trials actually show. There have been 10 clinical trials in humans looking at hydralazine for cancer. Unfortunately, nine of them combined hydralazine with valproate. Only one, the very first one, really looked at hydralazine without valproate, and that was all the way back in 2006, nearly 20 years ago. That trial combined hydralazine with standard chemotherapy to treat breast cancer. Okay, what were the results? 81% objective response rate, including a really impressive 31% complete response rate. That means that in 31%, all signs of breast cancer disappeared. Now, that's kind of standard for today's chemo, but back then that was a better than standard response. Now, those other nine clinical trials also showed increased response rates with the hydralazine and valproate combo, often somewhere between 50 to 80% objective response rates. Sometimes just those two, hydralazine and valproate, would have that effect by themselves, and sometimes they were combined with other treatments as a resensitizer. Imagine this, you're on chemo, it's working, and then all of a sudden one day it doesn't, and then they add these two drugs and the chemo works again. So, Hydralazine was very well tolerated, valproate less so. That combination of the two, we know that it has decent efficacy, but clinicians are reluctant to prescribe valproate, and we can't distinguish which drug was responsible for which effect in those combination trials. So that brings us to the current day, part six. What's new in this October 2025 paper? For the first time in a long time, researchers looked at just hydralazine by itself, and they were looking at trying to figure out what the mechanism was. They discovered a new mechanism for how it actually affects cells and relaxes blood vessels. They found that hydralazine directly blocks an enzyme called ADO. That's an oxygen sensing enzyme. So why does that matter? Tumors, again, often exist in these low oxygen environments, poor blood flow, low oxygen. Normally, cells in those kinds of environments would slow down or stop dividing. They would essentially hibernate until oxygen came back. Cancer cells cheat. They override this whole oxygen sensing system in order to keep growing. By blocking ADO, hydralazine forces cancer cells back into that low oxygen hibernation state. Glioblastoma cell lines, which strongly upregulate ADO, this was especially dramatic. The tumors completely stopped growing. In the mouse model with implanted glioblastoma tumors, the tumors were completely stabilized. They didn't grow at all. And this is where the internet gets super excited Whoa. and where we have to take a bit of a detour. Part seven, the two big problems no one is talking about with that paper. Here's what's missing from the hype. First, stopping tumor growth is not the same as eliminating cancer. It's a fantastic way to preserve life, but you haven't eliminated the cancer. This approach puts tumors into hibernation. That means the cancer is still there you'd need to stay on hydralazine indefinitely, all day, every day, for the rest of your entire life. Now, way better than dying. Just want to make sure everyone is clear this is a lifelong treatment. 
Second, and this one is critical, hydralazine does not cross the blood-brain barrier. In those mouse experiments that look so good, the drug was injected directly into the brain, needle through the skull. To do this in humans, you'd need to implant a catheter or a pump delivering the drug directly into the brain tissue. Now, some GBM patients already do go this route for other treatments, but it's pretty invasive and not all that common. People think that hydralazine is a pill that you take at home for glioblastoma because that's how it's used to treat high blood pressure or any of these other clinical trials that you read about. But that's not what you would do for glioblastoma. You can't. Now, the exciting part of this is that those 9 out of 10 clinical trials looking at epigenetic effects, they didn't focus on large and oxygen-starved tumors. As a matter of fact, they usually kept them out of the study. So there's likely an entirely new area of efficacy to test for, and if you didn't get the information about aspirin preventing metastases in time to prevent large tumors from forming, this may be a second chance for you to boost conventional therapy. Let's chat to see if your particular conditions line up well with hydralazine therapy. Could be great, could be useless, depends on the specifics. So part eight, the hidden benefits most people aren't aware of. One of the interesting clinical angles here is that hydralazine is almost never used alone for blood pressure. That's because by itself, it can also cause a racing heartbeat. Not something you want. It's almost always paired with a beta blocker. And that matters for a couple of reasons. First, because beta blockers reduce adrenaline and stress hormones. We covered that, there's a link down below and stress hormones are clearly linked to cancer progression. So while it's harder to convince a doctor to switch from a single drug to a two drug regimen, that combination will actually be far better for cancer outcomes than either drug alone. Hydralazine will probably be useful, maybe very useful, and the beta blocker will definitely be useful. And that combination is standard of care, so it gives you a rationale for insurance coverage. That's a legitimate two for one benefit. Okay, part number nine, the trade-off no one warns you about. So there's one last and very important caveat. This is not something to scare you off. This is not something about issues with the drug. This is issues with expectations. By putting cancer cells into hibernation, hydralazine would slow the visible effects of chemotherapy and radiation. Yes, it can make them work better, but it's going to slow them down. Why? Because those treatments work best on dividing cells. The cells die when they try and divide. So if the cancer cells are hibernating, they're not dividing. They'll still be damaged. They'll still die when they try and divide, but because you've slowed them down, they'll die much more slowly. What does this mean? This means that tumor shrinkage that say might have normally taken a month might take three. It could take three or four times longer than expected for your tumors to shrink. That does not mean that the treatment isn't working, but it might look like it because it's so much slower. And that's something that patients and doctors really need to understand and adjust their expectations about. You don't want to be on a treatment that's actually working well and freak out and change it because your tumor is growing slowly. Okay, so bottom line, hydralazine is old, safe, well understood clinically, and it's something that's easily implemented with your doctor, especially if you're already on any sort of blood pressure medication. Easy swap. This new paper adds a genuinely novel mechanism oxygen sensing and tumor hibernation. And there's a known potential for reactivating tumor suppression and immune surveillance. Please check out our videos on what is cancer and immunotherapy for more details on those. But hydralazine is no miracle pill by itself. It's an added benefit to other treatment and it's definitely being oversold for GBM. Can it be useful for GBM? Yes, under the right conditions. Used intelligently and honestly, hydralazine could be a very valuable adjunct to cancer therapy. So, for those of you with large tumors that are either immune cold or lack tumor suppressor expression, P53, APC, others, did your oncologist mention the hydralazine option? Let us know down below. Thank you. I'll see you in the next episode. Beyond these videos, if you need more personalized guidance or a deeper dive into specific treatments to have your treatment be as effective as possible, I offer one-on-one -on -one sessions and medical advocacy. I'm also in the process of developing an exclusive video series that breaks down each cancer treatment and drug in detail, along with interferences to avoid and ways to optimize for the ideal results. You can find information on both of these resources on our website, which is linked down below.
Again, if you found this video informative, please give it a thumbs up, click the notification bell, and subscribe to our channel for more science-based cancer insights.